It started with fear. Fear spread by a doctor. Fear of a vaccine given routinely to children, brought willingly by their parents for protection. <laughs> Tonight, Dispatches reveals what parents were never told. How a major London teaching hospital and Dr Andrew Wakefield launched a health scare which questioned the safety of the 3-in-1 MMR vaccine. My opinion is that the MMR should be suspended in favour of the single vaccines. How they planned a rival vaccine and products that could have made their fortune. And how when Dr Wakefield warned that MMR might lead to autism, his own laboratory had carried out tests on children that dramatically contradicted his claims. But when push comes to shove, Dr Andrew Wakefield is careful what he does and doesn't say. Dr Wakefield, I'm sorry to interrupt Brian dear Channel 4 Television. Um, could I talk to you about your research, sir, and your uh, commercial ambition? Excuse me. My name's Brian Deere and I've spent the last 12 months investigating a health scare that's not really like any other. Health scares, well, they come and they go, but this one's different. This one's changed people's lives. You've got some parents shunning a vaccine against infectious diseases that could kill or disable their children. And then you've got other parents, parents like Damien and Stacey, who I'm going to see now, agonising over the fact that their child became autistic soon after a shot of MMR. Three-year-old Rebecca is autistic. There are an estimated 100,000 children in Britain suffering from the disorder, and they exhibit a wide range of behavioural problems. I think maybe you have to push that one. I remember the first actual book that I got about autism and I read it and as I turned each page I cried because it was like reading a diary about my own daughter. One sign of Rebecca's autism is her need for repetitive routines which she never wants her parents Damien and Stacy to vary. She insists that her zipper always be in the same position and she must always follow the same route from her home. Rebecca hardly speaks. Her vocabulary is minimal. <laughs> and her poor communication combines with her need for routine to produce sporadic outbursts of frustration, even anger, when events aren't exactly as she expects. What can your daughter be like when she's, if you like, at her worst? I think the most terrible time is when she headbutt me and the T-shirt was full up of blood, mm. and that's how much she damaged me, and she was actually laughing. And if she starts acting up, I mean, do other people behave in a strange way towards her or treat her differently, you think? Yeah, because sometimes the looks, it's really awful. And I've actually gone home and cried a couple of times. It really gets to me that. But at times, Rebecca seems like any other child. She loves playing in the park and has a big thing for music. Why would she be doing that now? Why, is, why do you think she's behaving unusually? Just because we stop the music, you know. Oh, so if we stop the music, she'll get Sometimes upset. Sometimes she gets upset. Okay. Yeah. Rebecca was routinely vaccinated with the triple measles, mumps, and rubella jab, but her parents left it late because of the MMR scare. Well, there was this whole controversy about it in the news, and it made me a bit apprehensive about actually giving her the MMR in the first place. And I had a little word with my doctor, and my doctor basically reassured me. <laughs> But a fortnight later, Rebecca started shrieking, headbutting, and acting up. She was born normal, and then all of a sudden, after three years, they're telling you, well, no, your child's not normal anymore, she's got autism. And you're like, 
what, what the heck is that? Her parents were quick to see a connection. She was autistic. They blamed the vaccine. You can't even imagine the guilt that you feel because you... She never asked me, Mum, take me to get vaccinated. I still gave it to her, so I felt incredibly guilty. Their anxiety was fueled by a theory from doctors proposing a connection between autism and MMR. Those doctors worked at this hospital, the Royal Free in London. Here in the late 90s, Dr Andrew Wakefield was leading researchers trying to show a possible link between inflammatory bowel disease, autism and MMR. We are seeking to establish whether there is a genuine causal association between the MMR and this syndrome or not. It is our suspicion that there may well be, but that is far from being a causal uh, association that is proven beyond doubt. In February 1998, Dr Wakefield and his team published their findings in a leading medical journal. Described as an early report, the study was tiny, just 12 case histories. And Dr Wakefield claimed that in eight, parents had blamed MMR. Despite shortcomings in the paper, the Royal Free launched a media blitz for it that in time would circle the world. It was in a room behind me that they held a press conference, the results of which they surely must have foreseen. Dr Wakefield, of course, sat in pride of place, but the meeting was also graced by bigger fish. There was Professor Airy Zuckerman, Dean of the Medical School, and also Professor Roy Pounder, who today is Vice President of England's Royal College of Physicians. To launch a preliminary study with a press conference was a pretty unusual event. But broadcasters were also provided with a well-prepared video news release funded by the medical school. Although the hospital and the medical school consistently stressed the importance of MMR vaccination, the 20-minute video package contained claims which could only undermine the three-in-one. And here it is. Now, to help us all out, they've kindly provided us with uh, a really big needle and a little girl in pain. This is a very slick package for their message. What the heck? The family of an autistic boy saying they're sure it was MMR that done it. To find out that it was caused by a vaccine that you agreed to have done is just devastating. And Dr Wakefield expressing his view that MMR should be split into single shots, not once, not twice, four times. My opinion is that the risk is related to the combined vaccine, the MMR, suspended in favour of the single vaccines. The single vaccines are likely in this context to be safer. Giving the measles on its own reduces the risk of this particular syndrome developing. The hospital and the medical school deny that there was any campaign by them to undermine confidence in MMR. But a scare was born. Claims there could be a link between a common childhood vaccine and autism. Questions were raised today about the safety of the combined mumps, measles and rubella vaccine. New research showing a possible link with a bowel disease which could lead to autism. Although the Royal Freeze video package also contained a brief interview urging caution, it was Dr Wakefield who made the news. Measles, mumps and rubella given together may be too much for the immune system of some children to handle. Not surprisingly, this claim also made the press. And it was the call to ban the triple shot that caught attention. At the government's health protection agency, scientists watched the unfolding scare with alarm. Senior epidemiologist Dr Mary Ramsey was baffled. Dr Andrew Wakefield believed that the MMR should be broken up into single vaccines. Can you, can you think of any basis for that? Absolutely none at all. There's nothing in his work that really suggests where that came from. And it really was a very unfortunate thing to say because that's the thing that's had the most impact, I think, on the public who are very confused now about whether there is some problem with combining the vaccine. So from your point of view, this research uh, and this proposal from the Royal Free Group and Dr Wakefield in particular, that the vaccine should be broken up just came out of the blue. Absolutely. 
So why was Dr Wakefield questioning the triple vaccine? Was there more we should have been told? This is the London Patent Office. In their archives, they keep a copy of every UK patent application filed by inventors who want to protect their commercial interests. What worried parents didn't know is that nine months before the press conference and video release, Dr Wakefield and the Royal Free Medical School had filed the first in what would become a string of patent applications. Now look at this. Even as the MMR scare that they had started gathered pace, they filed documents in Britain, the United States, Canada, Australia and worldwide, claiming to have discovered, firstly, their own allegedly safer vaccine against measles, and secondly, treatments, perhaps even a complete cure for inflammatory bowel disease and autism. The public was unaware of the patent applications, and many of Dr Wakefield's colleagues were also in the dark. In 1997, Ian Bruce was Professor of Molecular Biology at Greenwich University and worked closely with Andrew Wakefield and his research team. Can I ask you what you make of that and what you're seeing on that page there? Well, well it's something that I've never seen before. But, uh, I mean, the interpretation of that is quite clear to me, and that is that they have a vaccine for measles, which presumably is an alternative to the existing vaccine. And then there was this patent application which followed shortly after the press conference at the Royal Free Hospital. The plans for new products were nothing if not ambitious. Remember, they also described a treatment or even a complete cure for both inflammatory bowel disease and autism. These sound like big claims to be making. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that they're fairly enormous claims, if they're valid. If they'd got these products that they're claiming here, would that be big money? Would it buy you a medical school? Um, well, I think that it might very well buy you a medical school. I mean, I think that the market for vaccines, especially globally applied vaccines, are obviously potentially enormous. And then a treatment for autism? I think that goes without saying. Patent applications are public documents and there's nothing wrong with inventors or indeed medical schools protecting their discoveries. But should we have been told that the Royal Free School of Medicine and Dr Wakefield had these commercial interests? It's something that should have almost certainly been made uh, public before now. The more that they can highlight the uh, potential danger that would be linked to vaccination with MMR and the more that they could highlight the benefits of alternative vaccination with their product, then obviously the greater the ability of their product to compete and uh, the greater chance that it would be economically successful. We wrote to the medical school asking them about their patent applications. They replied strongly denying any vested interest in attacking MMR. In part two, letters between senior royal free doctors questioning the ethics of Dr Wakefield's research. We show the medical school's patent applications to experts. It just doesn't make sense. The whole technique doesn't make sense. And we meet the American scientist named as the co-inventor. Do you believe that autism can be cured? Yes. When Dr Andrew Wakefield undermined confidence in MMR back in 1998, he didn't mention that he and the Royal Free Medical School had plans for their own products, including a rival vaccine and possibly a complete cure for autism. Publicly, the emphasis was on research. We sincerely hope that we can do something to ameliorate uh, the damage that has been done, uh, but we do not yet uh, know whether that's the case. So what exactly was Dr Wakefield's invention? The technical description in the patent documents outlines a complicated process to make capsules. It includes injecting mice with measles virus, extracting their white blood cells, freezing, thawing, and mixing these with human cells, 
and injecting the stuff into pregnant goats. As luck would have it, world experts in inflammatory bowel disease, Dr Wakefield's speciality, have gathered in Oxford for a conference. Maybe someone here can throw light on his revolutionary rival vaccine and products. To summarize what I've told you so far, perhaps six or seven molecules have formed the connection... Professor Rick Blumberg is an immunologist of the gut and president of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. You want me to look through this? Yeah, just have okay. a quick glance. I asked him about the technology outlined in the Royal Free Medical School's patent applications. I don't know what they're looking at. I just don't know what they're looking at in the end. They're, they're basically taking white blood cells. Um, and uh, they're actually, what's interesting, they're taking them from a mouse. So I'm not sure how that has to do with a human. So you put measles virus... Into mice. Into mice. Right. Take some of the white blood cells... Out of those mice. Out of the mice. And what do they do with them then? I, I... And then it's... Um, I'm, I'm trying to be very careful that I use my words um, sparingly. Um, but they then inject that into a pregnant goat and, and then collect the colostrum. That's what col colostrum is? Um... It would be basically the goat breast milk. OK. Does all this uh, seem somewhat strange to you? Uh, in a word, yes. During breaks, I checked Dr Wakefield's pregnant goat remedy with two more experts. Its probability of, of having any positive effect is going to be extremely small, if any. It just doesn't make sense. The whole technique doesn't make sense. I would say it's uh, uh, not credible. Really strange. Back in the lecture hall, there was a face from the Royal Freeze press conference. Professor Roy Pounder, Dr Wakefield's former boss, now Vice President of England's Royal College of Physicians. The two men's relationship has long been close. They even briefly dabbled in business. They were both shareholders in a company called Immunospecifics, which was meant to fund further research by selling diagnostic kits based on Dr Wakefield's theory. I'd been trying for months to ask him about Immunospecifics. Oh, Professor Panda. Yeah, hello. Brian Deere, Channel 4 Television. Oh, hello. Uh, could I talk to you about your collaboration with Andrew Wakefield at the Royal Free Hospital? No, we wanted to talk before about this. Uh, that's fine, thanks very much. Uh, so, could we perhaps you, have you an opportunity to chat? Sometimes. That's right. You can make a booking, see, that'd be fine. So, what should we do? We should call you at the hospital? Uh, you could talk to me, uh, make an appointment, that'd be fine. Sometime next I'm week? I'm not the doorstep, OK? Thank you. Sometime next week, perhaps? Yeah, ring me up next week. OK, thank you very much. Professor Pounder has been reported in newspapers criticising MMR. But fair's fair, I took him by surprise. So, as agreed, the next week, I called him. Oh, hello, Professor Pounder. It's Brian Deere from Channel 4 Television here. You're not prepared to be interviewed by me? OK. Well, I've tried. Um, thank you very much, then, sir. Bye-bye. Professor Pounder said, and I quote, I don't want to be interviewed by you at all. I wrote to Professor Pounder asking about immunospecifics, which was incorporated in February 1999 and dissolved nearly two years later. Professor Pounder replied that he couldn't comment on the issues raised in this program because Dr Wakefield's research is currently the subject of a General Medical Council inquiry. But what about the pregnant goat technology? Where did that come from? This is Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's the home of a once eminent immunologist, Professor Hugh Fudenberg. Professor Fudenberg has long been controversial. In 1989, he was caught up in a bizarre lawsuit involving the Food and Drug Administration, which told him he had to stop injecting his autistic child patients with blood products. Then in 1995, he was suspended from practicing medicine and made to pay a $10,000 fine for his misuse and misprescribing of controlled drugs. Despite his past, Professor Fudenberg is cited as the joint inventor of the Royal Free Medical School products. 
The documents say he's based around here, in the medical district just outside downtown Spartanburg, at the impressive-sounding Neuroimmuno Therapeutics Research Foundation. OK, so here's a UK patent application with a priority date of June 1997. That's nine months before the press conference that uh, started the MMR scare. And the applicant to the Royal Free Hospital School of Medicine, which is in London, and the Neuroimmunotherapeutics Research Foundation of Boiling Springs Road, Spartanburg, which is here. Doesn't look like one of America's premier research foundations. And in fact, it looks as though they've gone away. It turned out that Professor Fudenberg lives on the shores of Lake Bowen, just outside Spartanburg. The professor is semi-retired, but still charges up to $750 an hour to treat autistic children. He's the grandfather of the MMR scare and first published allegations of a link with autism a decade before Dr Wakefield. I mean, I wonder, what do you make of Dr Wakefield as a person? I don't know if you've met him. Yeah, I've met him. I stayed at his house. And what do you think of the work that um, he's done and has, has I published? I think it's good. He's very slow. He's, he's a gentleman. Plays lots of soccer. Lots of other things. Takes his time, but he's been very sound. Now, Dr Wakefield also claimed at one point to have discovered a treatment, possibly a complete cure no, for wrong. autism. He was wrong. He wanted me to be involved in that. I would have a part of it. It didn't make sense to me. I forget what it was, but it didn't make sense. That was the one with the goats? Yeah. That didn't make any sense then? No. So where was he getting that from? I don't know. It was just a wild idea, I guess. He wanted to set up a corporation, make me a partner. Give me 60,000 pounds. I wanted no part of it. And what would that do, that corporation? I, mean? I don't make money, I guess. I thought I wasn't interested in money. I wanted to make it quite clear I was doing this for scientific motives, not for monetary motives. Despite the fact that the professor's name features on the patent documents, he claims it was put there without his consent. He wants nothing more to do with the pregnant goat capsules. He says he's invented a better treatment, which he makes in his kitchen. Now, using this technology, do you believe that autism can be cured? Yes. Cured? Yes. It's cheap, it's oral, no injections. One pill a day, every other day, for three or six months. And where, yeah. where does that come from? From my bone marrow. From your own personal bone yeah. marrow? I mean, that's, that seems extraordinary. Yeah. But it wasn't just Andrew Wakefield who collaborated with the Maverick Professor back in 1997. It was also a major British hospital's medical school. As more patent applications were filed, the MMR scare, launched at the Royal Free, was gathering pace fueled by a stream of heart-rending claims by parents. Many mothers and fathers, desperate for answers, have given their support to Dr Wakefield. And the Royal Free became a magnet for autistic children drawn from all over the UK. They came to Malcolm Ward, the Royal Free's paediatric gastrointestinal unit, which at the time was a centre for two activities. Some children were being treated for a range of gut problems. But there was also the research being conducted by Dr Wakefield, trying to find a link between the live measles virus in MMR, inflammatory bowel disease and autism. We've now looked at 40 children and 39 of those have exactly the same findings and that's been intriguing. The children, some as young as three, were subjected to a battery of tests, including a colonoscopy, commonly used to investigate bowel disease. This procedure involved pushing a tube into the child's rectum to examine the intestine and collect tissue samples. These were tested for measles virus, which Dr Wakefield believed could prove a link between MMR and autism. But he didn't find the vital evidence. The work certainly raises a question mark over MMR vaccine, but it is, there is no proven link as such. And we are seeking to establish whether there is a genuine causal association between the MMR and this syndrome or not.
There was, however, growing concern among some of the medical staff about the research and its impact on the children. I've obtained confidential letters between the then Dean of the Royal Free Medical School and a consultant in community child health. In July 1998, Professor Airy Zuckerman invited comments on the ethics of the research being carried out by Dr Wakefield's team. He noted, I should add that I have voiced concerns in the past on aspects of these studies. Professor Brent Taylor, a Wakefield critic, responded, I've had concerns about the ethics of this research from the inception, particularly the issue of gaining informed consent from the children and also the invasive and extensive nature of the investigations. The Royal Free say they were entirely satisfied that Dr Wakefield's research was subjected to rigorous and appropriate ethical scrutiny. I'm told the medical school has advised staff not to speak to me, but to give you some idea of the high level of concern over the care of autistic children taking part in research here, let me read you the opinion of one consultant given to me over the telephone. I feel the whole show was in terrible turmoil, he said. Nurses were leaving and saying they didn't like what was being done to these children. Junior doctors were unhappy. It needed three people to hold these kids down in some cases just to have blood taken. These are difficult children to explain to what is going on. I feel very sorry for the children who I feel were being abused. Coming up how before launching the MMR scare, Dr Wakefield knew of results from his own laboratory that dramatically contradicted his theory. He should have taken into account my work before going ahead and publishing. And we meet the man himself. <laughs> Dr Wakefield, I'm sorry to interrupt Brian dear Channel 4 Television. Um, could I talk to you about your research, sir, and your uh, commercial ambition? Excuse me. Could I talk to you, sir? Parents have very serious questions to ask you, sir. When Dr Wakefield launched the MMR scare back in 1998, he did so with a study of just 12 autistic children. And the evidence for a link between MMR and autism was anecdotal. The parents of eight blamed the vaccine. In the Royal Free's video press release provided to broadcasters, Dr Wakefield gave many the impression that his research team was on its way to scientifically proving a link. What we've been able to do here, by directly visualising and biopsying the bowel, uh, is to confirm, at least in this group of children, that there is a link, it may well be a, a, a link between gut inflammation and behavioural abnormalities. But I've discovered evidence that casts a different light and undermines Dr Wakefield's credibility. At the time, Nick Chadwick was a PhD student and Dr Wakefield's research assistant. What's Andrew Wakefield like, the man? Um, he's very charismatic, uh, very driven um, and very enthusiastic. So, um, as in terms of a leader, he's a very good person to, to take charge of a, of a group. According to Dr Wakefield's theory, live measles virus in MMR can cause inflammatory bowel disease and this can lead to autism. He believed that the virus could persist in the guts of autistic children who've been vaccinated with MMR. Chadwick's role was to test samples from the children. First, he established a scientifically valid system using sensitive molecular methods that would satisfy Dr Wakefield and his head of department, Professor Roy Pounder. Were Professor Pounder and Dr Wakefield happy with the work that you've done on that way of finding measles virus? I believe so, yeah. They were happy to put their name on a paper. Um, Andrew Wakefield encouraged me to, to write the paper and um, helped me submit it. The paper was published in the prestigious Journal of Virological Methods. Having agreed his technique with his supervisors, Chadwick set about testing tissue samples from autistic children for measles virus, again under Dr Wakefield's supervision. And are these children the same children that went on to be published in The Lancet, leading to the MMR scare? Yeah, that's right. 
Did you find measles virus in those children? No. No single case did I find any measles virus in those children. Wakefield and Chadwick weren't just looking for measles virus in gut samples. Some children had also been given lumbar punctures, a difficult, painful procedure to take brain fluid from the spine. You looked at some cerebrospinal fluid That's taken right. by lumbar puncture. Did you find any measles virus in those? No. So you found no measles virus in the children who were presented to the public at the very foundation of the MMR scare, mm. where Dr. Wakefield's theory was that it was measles virus itself that was responsible for a bowel disease and then leading on to some kinds of autism, and you found no measles virus. That's correct. And you must have gone to him one day and said, well, I've done the tests on these children, and I couldn't find measles virus. What do you say to that? Um, it, we had, had long discussions about possible reasons why um, my results weren't um, linking in with the hypothesis. Um, my personal opinion was that it's not there, but um, Andrew Wakefield had some issues about sensitivity problems, which I found a bit surprising since he'd already approved of the methods that we used to try and detect measles virus. If Dr Wakefield now had concerns about Chadwick's molecular tests, previously he had endorsed them. In an earlier study on adults with inflammatory bowel disease, Chadwick had used the same methods and Dr Wakefield and Professor Pounder co-authored this paper. Another of the authors was Ian Bruce. He's a renowned molecular biologist and supervised Chadwick's royal free research alongside Dr Wakefield. If there had been measles virus there in those tissues, would he have found it? My confidence is that he would. His um, approach was rigorous. He um, designed and performed the experiments in a way that was, in my view, scientifically correct. And if he had found, if there were to have been measles virus present, then he would have found it. Seven years on, and Nick Chadwick, now Dr Chadwick, works at the University of Manchester. He's lived with the knowledge that when Dr Wakefield launched the MMR scare, Dr Wakefield knew that his own laboratory had dramatically contradicted his theory. Why are you telling us this now? Well, in hindsight, I realised that quite a, a big story was made out of the initial claim, and I think it's important to... Um, to tell people about how there really wasn't the evidence there right from the beginning to justify those claims. What did you think when you saw this press conference and all the publicity that followed and this tremendous scare? Well, I assumed that it would die its own death, the whole story, to be honest. I assumed that if um, Andrew Wakefield couldn't get the molecular evidence, then the story would um, die away. Um, from my own personal perspective, I was a student, Andy was the group leader. There wasn't really much of a, an argument that I could make, to be honest. So how did you feel when the MMR scare took off? I was shocked, frankly. Do you think you should have said something at the time? Um, it's a difficult question to answer. I, I, I don't know that anybody would have listened um, in a way that would have made a difference. In a purely personal context, yeah, I feel that probably we should have been more vocal. But if anyone should have been more vocal in 1998, surely it was Dr Wakefield himself. And there was something else he didn't tell the assembled press, as I revealed in the Sunday Times last February. Unknown to Dr Wakefield's colleagues, the research on autistic children had begun with a contract from a firm of solicitors who were trying to sue MMR manufacturers. And when that information emerged from my investigation earlier this year, the authors of the research voted to retract their claim of ever having found a possible link between MMR and autism at all. But the damage had been done. No parent wants to expose their child to unnecessary danger. Yet measles, mumps and rubella can still be a serious threat. 
the government responded with glossy ad campaigns, urging parents to have their children immunised. But confidence in MMR had been shaken. And many parents were left confused. Come on, have some lunch. Have some lunch, darling. Here's 14-month-old Aaron. He's Tracy Broadhurst's first. She's given up work to care for him full time, and now she's facing a dilemma. Aaron is due his MMR. Yay! Good tomatoes, aren't they? I'm ultimately frightened that I'm going to take this beautiful, lovely little boy, smiling happy, into the surgery to do the right thing for him. And the actual upshot of it will be that it won't be the right thing because I'll have cause the reaction in his body that's going to give him this development disorder. And then there's the fear of, if I don't take him along and he gets measles and he ends up with a form of brain damage or even dies because of it, I've then got to live with that as well. After speaking to a health visitor, Tracy put aside her fears and booked Aaron for his three-in-one. But then she went on the internet. I've tried to find out the facts for myself to make an informed choice. I've got on one hand a set of professionals saying, in their opinion, it's safe, but then there's another set of professionals saying, well, hang on a minute, I don't believe that to be the case. So I thought, I'm not going to take him today. So I didn't take him. Nearly seven years after the Royal Free and Dr Wakefield launched the vaccine scare, many parents remain worried. MMR vaccination rates have fallen from 92% to as low as 50% in some areas. And doctors say Britain may this winter be facing its first measles epidemic since the 1980s. People say, well, measles used to be a routine illness. Everybody got it. I certainly had it. Why should we be so worried about it? Is it that big a deal? Yeah, it was a routine illness. Everyone caught it, and every year about 100 children died of it, even, you know, as recently as the 60s. And worldwide, about a million children die each year from this disease. And it, it could well end up being a public health disaster. Those fears for public health became a reality in the year 2000 in Ireland, where vaccine take-up is traditionally lower than in Britain. There was a serious measles outbreak in North Dublin, which left 111 admitted to hospital, including 13 in intensive care, and three dead. Dimitri Pop and his wife Maria had just moved to Dublin from Romania to start a new life. They now have two children, Mark and Abigail. But in the outbreak of 2000, their first child, Naomi, was one of those who died. She was 14 months old and nearly due her MMR when her parents became concerned. She had spots all over her and she couldn't, she couldn't eat. She had high fever, so I brought her in hospital and she was seen by the doctor who said, it's only measles. Initially, she seemed to respond to treatment. But five weeks later, her parents noticed something worrying. Like, she would tweet her eye like that, mm. with no reason. And she, like, she went still for a couple of seconds. And we suddenly said something is wrong with her. The doctor who seen her, she, he said she's got brain damage. So what was that day like? You went went to the hospital and the doctor said, well, your daughter's got brain damage. No, you oh, gosh. you won't be able to understand the feeling. Like it's it's like the end of the world. They were saying that she's gonna die. We just said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to believe that. I hope she's gonna be okay. And I know you do your best. In Naomi's case, measles attacked her brain, producing a horrifying 11-month degeneration. She spent her last three weeks in intensive care. And what were those three weeks like? Oh, the worst. Oh, I didn't want to accept it until it happened. But then that final day came. It did, yeah. The final day came and it was a bad day. We knew she's dead. Like they were taking out her no. tubes and all that stuff. I know we're not going to bring her back, but even like if we know that we'd save someone else's child from this, would be helpful. Mm. Like it's not fair for children to die like that. It's not fair at all. 
Dr Wakefield left the Royal Free by mutual consent in December 2001. At that time, the patent applications for a rival vaccine and a possible cure for autism were relinquished by the medical school and assigned to him. He now spends much of his time in America. He's the research director of a non-profit organization in Florida called the International Child Development Resource Center. This draws parents of autistic children, some of them from Britain, in search of answers and treatment. They have a sister organization, the Good News Doctor Foundation, displaying a heady mix of religion and medicine. Among their activities, they promote a range of products for autism, described as nutritional supplements, including CoQ10, Colostrum Gold, and a hormone injection called Secretin. At this London hospital, Pat Howlin is a professor of clinical psychology and has studied what she believes is a growing market in alternative products for autism. Now, here's something I can't understand. We've got research paper after research paper on secretin, and they all say that this hormone does not work. How is it, then, that we find secretin still being sold, still being given to parents for their children, as, as some kind of remedy for autism? What's going on there? I, I think the trouble is autism's a big money spinner for a lot of people. Um, parents are very vulnerable, they desperately want help for their child and obviously it's nicer to have a simpler answer like this, um, a few shots of secretin, um, pills labelled IQ or concentration or whatever. They're simple answers. Now we paid, um, what, £21.15 for this little pot of pills. Sea Buddies, which is enzymatic therapy, or um, there's another one here, MSM for sulfation, or um, coenzyme Q10. Mm. I mean, what is going on with all this well, kind of Well, people are making a lot of money out of it. And it's as simple as that. I th I'm afraid so, yes. For most of these, there's absolutely no research evidence one way or the other. Now, that's a pretty bad picture, isn't it, for the parents of autistic children? Yes, yeah. No, I think they um, are a very vulnerable group. I've come back to America in search of Dr Wakefield, not least to ask him why he lends his reputation to an organisation that promotes products for which I can find no convincing scientific backing. This is Melbourne, Florida, about uh, an hour southeast of Orlando. It's a conservative country, uh, strong Republican. And it's the kind of area where, uh, if it comes to finding a cause for autism, they blame the government before they blame God. The International Child Development Resource Centre, where Dr Wakefield is research director, is based here. OK, so here seems to be the deal. Dr Jeff Bradstreet, Dr Jerry Cartsnell and Dr Andrew Wakefield. And it seems that a big part of what they're doing here is to promote various products which they say can help autistic children, such as uh, Pure Kids, for example, which they say has been developed by neurological specialists, and um, Colostrum Gold. Now, they recommend these at various meetings which they attend around the United States, charging parents perhaps $250 a go. And we'll just see what they've got to say about these products here at their offices. My name's Brian Deere. I'm from the UK's Channel 4 Television. We'd like to talk to you about some of the products you're selling for uh, the parents of autistic children. Okay, hold on just a moment. Thank you. Now, I'm also hoping to contact Dr. Wakefield. Is he, I believe he's your director of research. Right, but he's not in our facility or even in this state right now. Um, I don't exactly know where he is, but Dr. Bradstreet would be right. able to. But he's still your director of research here. Um, do you have to clarify that with Dr. B? Okay. Um, maybe you could come around 11.30 tomorrow okay. morning. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right but Dr. Bradstreet cancelled his appointment and said he didn't want to be interviewed by me. In a statement, he said that any suggestion of profiteering was completely baseless. He claimed that many of his patients pay nothing for his services and that the organisation does not promote any products as remedies for autism. 
Eventually, I tracked down Dr. Wakefield some 900 miles from Florida. This is downtown Indianapolis in the American Midwest. Dr. Wakefield is the star attraction here at a conference on autism. I've been trying now to speak with him for a year. We even wrote, but he didn't reply. The meeting is organized by the Autism Society of America. On the US conference circuit, Dr. Wakefield has found a new audience for his theories. He was the last speaker of the day, so I approached him at the end of his presentation. <laughs> Dr. Wakefield, I'm sorry to interrupt Brian dear Channel 4 Television. Um, could I talk to you about your research, sir, and your uh, commercial ambitions? Excuse me. Could I talk to you, sir? Parents have very serious questions to ask you, sir. Excuse me, sir. Dr. Wakefield, sir. Apparently sir, not. could we talk to you about your product, sir? Dr. Wakefield, sir. I wanted to ask him about the patent applications and about his own lab contradicting his claims. Dr. Wakefield, sir, we have very important questions to ask you about your research and your commercial ambitions, sir. These are very important questions. I'm sure you would have the time to explain what you've been up to. If you're confident about your work, sir, and the quality of your research, sir, and that your commercial ambitions will withstand public scrutiny, sir, you will stand your ground, sir. And I'll... I wrote to Dr Wakefield again. His solicitors first replied that it would be inappropriate to respond to the issues raised in this film because of the General Medical Council investigation into his research. Later, they said that he was under no legal or professional obligation to disclose the patents, which they claim were unrelated to his views about MMR. Hey, if the is the truth and he's out helping people, why don't you guys go away? Please, you did, not, you did not get press approval. You will have to leave the premises. Please. Before I call the Indianapolis Police Department. Stacy and Damien no longer believe that their daughter's autism was caused by MMR. After researching and remembering Rebecca as a baby, they realised that she had already shown symptoms before she was vaccinated. Autism is strong in my family. Um, I've got two cousins that were diagnosed with autism. So I'm starting now to believe that it's hereditary. Now they're angry that anybody raised a link with MMR at all. When you, your child gets diagnosed with such a terrible diagnosis of autism, that's such a life-changing and challenging thing that you have to go through, you don't need people putting that into your head. Hearing people trying to say it's the MMR, you know, some are saying it's not the MMR, you know, it's just, it's just really confusing, you know, and it's even makes it harder to come to terms with. Now she's been diagnosed as autistic. What are your hopes for her now? Well, it's just one, one simple hope, and I'm just hoping that she'll talk. I only wish that we've got to be able to communicate with our child. Anything else? Just that she'll be happy and people will accept her. Do you think they will? Who knows? I hope so.